If you hear screams on Mount Everest, it's already too late. My best friend, Mike, was the one who invited me to join their triennial trip to Everest. I almost said no. For one, I didn't have $50,000 to blow on a guided expedition, climbing permit, and gear. For another, I'm not that kind of guy. Walking between my apartment and 7-Eleven was the extent of my physical activity last year. But Mike had offered to help cover my share of the trip, and then Derek said, sneeringly, if you could even keep up, you know, it's every man for himself up there, right? That sealed it. And guys like Derek have looked down on me my whole life. And that's how I ended up here, in a hospital bed in Nepal. Out of the 37 climbers who made it to Camp 3 and stayed the night, I'm the only one who survived. And that was due to sheer luck. Tashi and Sylvie left C3 two hours ago after arriving here because Sylvie had symptoms of high altitude pulmonary edema, also known as HAPE, which no one responded via radio the next day. Tashi alerted the rescue workers. They found me nearly 2,000 feet from where I'd fallen. I had two cracked ribs, a fractured pelvis, and a concussion. I barely pulled through. Everyone thinks that an avalanche had swept the other climbers away, but I'm here to tell you the truth about what happened on Everest. It's not the avalanches, crevices, or the fallen ice you need to fear. I slowly and carefully edged onto the first of the three ladders the Sherpas had set out over the crevice. This was our third rotation through the Kumbu Icefall, a river of ice strung across towering ice seracs and deep crevices. If the weather permitted us, we'd spend the night at Camp 2, tomorrow night at Camp 3, five hours overnight at Camp 4, also known as the South Coal, and then push for the summit. Mike was 20 feet ahead of me. Derek had passed us 10 minutes ago along with Jack and Sylvie, our head guide and junior guide respectively. Jack insisted that we stay close together so that he could supervise us. I tried not to dwell on the fact that I was slowing the whole team down. Everyone besides me had high altitude experience, even if it was just summoning Kilimanjaro. Just then a gust of wind sent the ladder swaying beneath me and my right crampon nearly slipped. Even though I was clipped to the safety rope, I pictured myself falling, my body repeatedly smashing against the icy walls of the crevice until I landed in a broken heap at the bottom. Uh, go back to base camp, suggested a craven inner voice. Uh, better yet, go back to the airport and just get the hell out of here. Unable to help myself, I darted a look downwards and caught a flash of movement. Something large and pale clung to the sheer icy walls of the crevice, right below the ladder. As though it felt my eyes on it, it rapidly scuttled out of sight. What the actual fuck? It had almost looked like, well, like a person. Hey, you alright, Theo? I flinched and nearly fell after all. That was Tashi. One of the two climbing Sherpas on our team. Tashi had hung back to track our progress and help us navigate the icefall. While the rest of us struggled to breathe, the Sherpas remained unaffected by the high altitude. They were the true heroes of Everest. The ones who navigated the safest and most direct routes, fixed ropes, and much more. Many of the Sherpas also had legends about Everest, which they called Chamalunga. They believed that the Buddhist goddess, Mio Langsema, resided at its summit. A handful of Sherpas even claimed that hungry ghosts haunted the mountain. Ghosts that had never been human. Others mentioned the disappearances of climbers whose bodies had never been found. In fact, it had been difficult to find Sherpa guides for our expedition this month. Derek wasn't the type of guy who would take no for an answer. Not when he could throw a shit ton of money at the problem. Theo? Do you need to head back down? I realized that I had frozen in place for the past couple of minutes. I'm fine. 
No way in hell was I going back out over something I thought I saw. Not like Derek would ever let me live that down. I forced myself to relax my white knuckled grip on the ropes and took a cautious step forward. Then another. And another. My heart still thundered wildly in my chest, but I knew I could make it to the summit. Probably. Maybe. One thing at a time to you. Camp 2 was located at the foot of the Lotsey face. Everest dominated the skyline, punching straight up through the air and crowding out her neighboring peaks. By the time we reached Camp 2, I was more than ready to collapse. If my tent hadn't already been set up for me, I would have dropped to the ground and refused to move. I beelined towards it, past the 80 or so other tents at Camp 2, crawled into my sleeping bag and passed the fuck out. An odd rustling noise woke me up in the dead of night. At first I assumed that I imagined it. The roar of the wind, so much like the roar of the surf, provided a relaxing soundtrack and I nearly fell back to sleep when the sound had repeated itself. Louder this time. I fumbled for my headlamp. Multiple people stood outside my tent, pushing at it from all sides. I could see the shapes of their hands deforming the nylon fabric. Fear clawed up my throat, and it took a solid minute for me to realize that it had to be Derek fucking with me. Derek and his friends from the New Zealand team. Ever since the trip had started, he made one snide joke after another about my lack of high altitude experience. Infuriated, I tried to surge to my feet, forgetting that I was still partially zipped in my sleeping bag. Fuck! By the time I managed to leave the tent, everyone else had vanished. I glared out at the empty expanse of snow and yelled, you guys are complete douchebags. As I turned around to go back inside, something struck me about the ground beneath my tent, but I was too eager to get warm again and dwell on it. Not for the first time, I wondered why Mike even hung out with Derek. Mike was a quiet, thoughtful guy embarrassed about his wealth. Derek was a trust fun dude bro who always had a one up you I let it go I told myself in three days you'll be standing at the top of Everest and I did manage to let it go at least until I saw Derek sitting in our mess tent Jack had woken us up before sunrise and thanks to Derek's juvenile prank I'd gotten less than three hours of sleep I marched over to his table why did you fuck with my tent last night? Derek raised his eyebrows. What are you talking about? Last night, you messed with my tent. Uh, no, I didn't. He leaned forward and gave me a sunny smile full of teeth. Maybe you should head back to base camp and get checked out by Angela. Angela was our base camp manager and doctor. Before we set out on our first rotation, She'd given us a long list of warning signs about HAPE and HACE. She also mentioned the possibility of experiencing high altitude psychosis, but I hadn't hallucinated what happened last night. Anyway, I knew why Derek was making the suggestion. It wasn't out of concern for my well-being. He just didn't want me slowing them down. Ah, forget it. I said through gritted teeth, leaving the tent. His laughter chased me out, and I nearly walked right into Sylvie. And she stepped around me at the last second. Sorry, I muttered, knowing that the tips of my ears were tuning a bright red. Sylvie somehow looked even more beautiful up here than she had at base camp. I wasn't the only one who noticed her. Derek had spent the first two weeks of our trip bragging to her about summoning Choi and Denali, despite her obvious disinterest. Jack says it's time for us to climb Lotsa. She said unperturbed and gathered everyone else up. Jack began to review what to do with the valves in our oxygen canisters iced over or if our oxygen pipes were knocked loose. He already going over the basics of using bottled oxygen at base camp, so I tuned him out in favor of staring up at the climb ahead of us. The Lotsa face was a wall of glacial blue ice that rose at pitches ranging from 40 to 50 degrees, complete with the occasional 80 degree bulges. After passing those, it was a simple, simple, steep climb up to Camp 3, which punctuated the face. 
We'd purposely avoid telling anyone else about our summit bid, so the queue to climb wasn't as bad as it could have been. I tried to find a rhythm between kicking my crampons into the hard ice and hauling myself up with the Jumars, but I kept needing to stop and allow faster climbers to clip their carbiners to a rope ahead of me. Halfway through the climb, I finally realized what had been bothering me about last night. I hadn't seen any footprints outside my tent. None, except for my own. Could Derek had been right? Had I just imagined the entire event? The same way I'd imagine seeing a man in a crevice? No, ain't no way. But unease swept over me in a wave, and it didn't leave me even after I arrived at Camp 3. The view from Camp 3 almost made the climb worth it. It allowed us to see the clouds rolling in from the western CWM. The flat glacial valley we passed through yesterday, and the flumes drifting in from Everest's summit. Tashi and Dorje had painstakingly dug out small terraces for our tents to rest on. They'd chosen a spot high above the other team's tents, which meant that we'd get a head start on the climb tomorrow. There weren't that many other teams here anyway. Only three. Another American one, the Canadian one, and the New Zealand team. At 23,950 feet above sea level, the simplest actions from tying on my crampons to picking up my water bottle became immensely difficult, as though someone had tied heavy weights to my limbs. It took 10 minutes of breathing in the artificial air from my oxygen canister before my brain started working normally again. We each had six bottles of oxygen, three to climb up to the summit, and another three to get back down. Tomorrow night at the South Coal would be the first time we were in the death zone. It was called that because of the altitude. The human body could no longer acclimatize to the lack of oxygen. Our cells would begin to die from oxygen deprivation. As Mike and I went into the tent we'd be sharing from here on out, I debated whether or not to bring up what I'd seen last night. Would he tell me to head back down to base camp too? But before I could say anything, Mike broke the silence first. Thanks for coming with me, man. It's good to have you here. Yeah, of course. Thanks for inviting me. I just... I'm sorry that you had to cover my share of the trip. I laugh awkwardly and I look down at my water bottle to cover up my discomfort. How did you get into mountain climbing anyway? I thought you uh, hated heights. I vividly remember the time our families had gone to Disney World together. Mike and I had been 10 years old and I'm convinced him to ride Space Mountain with me. As soon as the roller coaster moved forward, he started shrieking his head off. Mike grinned sheepishly, as though he was remembering Space Mountain too. Yeah, I do, but there's nothing else out there that beats climbing. When you're here, it's like the rest of the world just fades away. And all the bullshit with it. Everything's simpler. Maybe scarier, but it's also more real. I've never felt like it's anywhere else. I sort of knew what he meant. Life at base camp was simpler. Climb, eat, sleep, rinse and repeat. And I could easily see how the dangers here made a successful summit was even sweeter. I thought of Jack saying that climbing a mountain revealed who you truly were, but it ground you down until you had no defenses left. The question burst out of me before I could stop it. Do you really think we'll make it all the way? I hadn't cared about summoning when we first arrived at base camp. I just hadn't wanted to embarrass myself, but now the idea of just turning back before reaching the top seemed insane. Yeah, Jack and the Sherpas will get us there. Mike fell asleep right away, but I kept drifting off and startling back awake. I would think that hours had passed only to discover it only been 10 minutes. Wearing the oxygen mask was like having plastic wrapped around my head. It was nearing 3 a.m., and I had just closed my eyes again when I heard the sound of screams. Long, painful screams. I shook Mike awake. Hey, come on, uh, we need to go. There's something wrong out there. What? What are you talking about? I don't know. I grabbed my headlamp from and headed outside. 
It took about a minute for me to comprehend what exactly I was looking at. Blood. Everywhere. And the corpses of the other climbers. Most of them were barely recognizable. Something had torn them apart like ragdolls and trampled all over the tents below us. I ran towards a woman who had collapsed a few feet from us when I recognized. She was on the New Zealand team. Maybe we weren't too late. Maybe we could bring her inside. And then I realized. She'd been ripped nearly in half. Her intestines spilled out in messy loops and the ragged edges of her torn skin fluttered in the wind. Oh, we need to get Jack, Mike said, his face drawn and pained. My eyes kept catching on her outstretched arm. The fingers curled limply into her palm. With difficulty, I forced myself to look away. Yeah, but what about everyone else? I don't see Toshi and Sylvie's tent. But Jack can radio base camp. He'll let them know what happened here. He was right. Toshi and Sylvie's tent had just vanished. I didn't want to think about what that meant. I followed Mike towards Jack and Dorsey's tent, trying not to look around any more than I had to. The nameless woman's corpse remained burned into my mind's eye, like a hole charred into a piece of paper. Everyone here might be dead already, except for us. The thought made the world waver around me, and I had to bite the inside of my cheek until I tasted blood. Dumb. Because at this altitude, the wound wouldn't heal. The pain helped steady me. As Mike unzipped Jack's tent, I became aware of a loud slurping sound, as though someone was sucking up a milkshake through a straw. I tried to grab Mike's arm, but he moved out of reach. He shouted, Jack, we need your help. We need your... He stopped speaking as the light of his headlamp revealed what was only a few feet away from us. The man I'd seen in the crevice the other day, the man I convinced myself I'd imagined, was crouched over something long and bloody. He wore faded, tattered clothes, and his skin was a bloodless white, as pale as the snow on the ground. His head snapped up, and I took an involuntary step backwards because it wasn't a man after all. It couldn't be. Its eyes were two shiny silver quarters in its mouth a round disc full of sharp, inward-pointing teeth. It lunged towards us, moving jerkily. Mike knocked me backwards as he turned to run, but he was too late. It fell on him. He tried to get his arms up to protect his face and only partially succeeded. It snapped off the fingers of his right hand, and blood sprayed out from the stumps and across the tent ceiling. As it fastened his mouth over Mike's neck, he let loose a high, miserable scream. Oh, for fuck's sake, do something. My mind screamed at me. I dropped onto all fours to search and jumble the objects in the tent. Mike's screams cut off right as I found the ice axe buried under Jack's torn sleeping bag. It took me 30 seconds to get it. Tops. But when I turned around, Mike and the thing had just vanished. A thick trail of blood led me to where the back of the tent had been ripped open. Mike... I ran outside, trying to look in every direction at once, but he was nowhere in sight. All I saw was Jack, or what was left of him. His lower jaw was missing, and his half-severed tongue was nestled in a hollow of his throat, still connected to a thin scrap of muscle. I kept going, circling around our tents until I was at the front again. It had started snowing, making it even harder to look around. The area between my shoulder blades itched with the awareness that Something lurked in the shadows in the darkness. Something biding its time. Something brushed against my shoulder. I wheeled around and swung the axe. Terror went through my entire body, only to find Derek staring back at me, his eyes wide and frightened. He dodged at the last second, so that I overbalanced and the point of the axe went wide. What the fuck is wrong with you, he shouted. I ignored this. Have you seen Mike anywhere? No. No, I haven't seen anyone aside from you, you fucking psycho. I just came outside because I heard screams. He trailed off and slammed me up against the tent. What happened here? Did you do this? I opened my mouth to tell him that I hadn't done anything. 
only for a terrible ringing shriek to render my explanation unnecessary. We looked up to see the thing from before clinging to the wall of ice, ten feet above us. It should have been impossible. The ice had no handholds or footholds, but it maintained its position without any apparent effort. Our gazes locked, and at that moment, I had no doubt it was seeing me. Really seeing me. Its silver eyes shone with sly cunning, and it grinned at me. A horrible expression that changed its features into a twisted mockery of a human face. It leapt, and before I could defend myself, its weight drove me to the ground and ripped the axe out of my hands. It darted its head forward like a striking snake, and I barely managed to stop it from biting a chunk of flesh out of my cheek. But it was too strong for me to hold back much longer. My finger slid slowly off its face. It reared back for another strike, and its lengthy mouth stretching impossibly wide. I flinched away pointlessly. Abruptly, his face changed, the mouth rounding into a surprised O as the point of an axe came shoving out of its right eye, through the back of its head. I squirmed out from underneath it. Derek stood over me, his mouth twisted into a grimace. It shrieked again like a hundred nails scraping down a hundred chalkboards. And this time, I knew somehow that it was communicating, talking. Black tarry stuff poured out from its punctured eye, and it worthed helplessly on its back like an overturned cockroach, and it shivered all over and began to rot, eyes sinking into the sockets, skin loosening from the bones and shriveling, and the hair drifting away from the skull. It didn't stop there either, fingernails peeling away, teeth falling out one after another, and the bones cracking and crumbling into dust, only for another gust of wind to scatter the entire pile of dusty bones and pieces across the snow. It all happened so quickly that by the time I got to my feet, it was gone. What was that thing? asked Derek, shuddering. He no longer looked like the arrogant asshole who'd spent the entire trip antagonizing me. More like a little kid who just discovered that the monsters hiding in his closet were real. No idea, but we need to get out of here now. I thought briefly of Mike, who might still be alive. Only I knew better. No one could have lost the amount of blood that he had and still survive, at least not without receiving immediate medical attention. And do you want to know the worst thing about it? My brain. It accepted the fact that he was dead, that I just lost my best friend of over 12 years. And it went on coldly, calculating my odds of surviving long enough to get back down to the base camp. As if to emphasize my words, a chorus of unholy screeches echoed through the night. We exchanged a wordless look and ran for it. I sprinted past the nameless dead women on my right. One of her eyelids had popped open while the other one was still gum shut. So that she seemed to be given a cynical wink. You can run, but it won't help. If I thought that the climb was difficult before, it was nothing compared to when my life was on the line. My entire world narrowed down to kicking my crampons into the hard blue ice and clinging onto the face as the wind tried to pry me loose. I hadn't had time to clip myself into the fixed rope. If I fell, it wouldn't be a soft, gentle landing. I'd fall more than 5,000 feet. God only knew where I'd end up. Derek had outpaced me, but he started cursing under his breath. Rocks clattered down the slope. Go back up, he screamed. Go up. I glanced down. Silver pinpricks of light glowed into the darkness, rapidly approaching us. There were more of those things, maybe six or eight, and they were all heading straight towards us. They easily scuttled over the steep, icy bulges of the face, spreading out in line to prevent us from climbing past them. The only way for us to go was up into the death zone. The angle of the slope above Camp 3 was steep, much steeper than I anticipated. Despite pushing myself to climb as quickly as I could, my calves trembled with fatigue. My breath kept coming short, and my head ached from fatigue. Derek was right on my heels, partially gasping for air. The closer those things got to us, the more clearly we heard the strange guttural shrieks, screeches, and hisses that comprised their language. They were only ten feet behind us now. My stomach tightened with dread, 
and I waited for a claw-tipped hand to close around my ankle with an iron grip. Nothing happened. They should have caught up to us already, but they were pacing themselves, falling back, allowing us to continue climbing. Why? I found the answer in their grinning, bloodthirsty faces, because there was no way out. Even if we climbed six hours it took to reach the South Coal and managed to stay ahead of them the whole time, all the way up to the summit, then what? What would we do at the summit, with nowhere else to climb? What could we do? We can't keep climbing up, I shouted to Derek. I started scrambling sideways, away from the established route. Doing so meant risking falling into the crevice, but a swift death was better than being ripped apart from limb to limb. Additional shrieks rang through the night, and I knew without looking that they'd change course to follow us. The slope eventually leveled out, and we stumbled over an ankle-breaking mixture of snow, ice, and rocks. Derek in the lead, stinging sweat dripped into my eyes, and the world turned blurry as my body struggled to cope with the lack of oxygen. I spotted an outcropping of large boulders ahead. Maybe we could throw ourselves behind them. Maybe. Suddenly, one of them scrambled forward on all fours to block our path. The other five surrounded us in a loose circle. From the back, they looked like normal men and women, but the illusion fell away entirely once they faced you. They all had the same unnatural silver eyes and their lamprey mouths, the same malicious expressions on their faces. I turned to Derek. He had a spare ice pick in his hands. I gestured towards it, but instead of giving one to me, he backed away and shook his head. He didn't even have time to say it aloud. It's every man for himself up here, had been his constant refrain since our trip had started. And I didn't have any time to convince him. They began to dart forward one at a time, playing with us. Without a weapon, I couldn't do much other than attempt to dodge them, and fail. One of them fainted towards me, then to the left, and then swung around to strike me in the throat. I fell over with a panicked cry when I tentatively touched my throat. I felt a loose flap of skin hanging down nearly to my chest. I staggered back up just in time to see Derek swing both of his axes at once. It darted underneath and as smoothly as though they rehearsed this move a thousand times and caught the head of the axe without even trying. His other arm whipped out, lightning fast and clawed open his stomach. Derek screamed and collapsed. Both arms crossed over him protectively. The circle around us tightened and I finally understood that I was going to die here. We were both going to die here. I tried to steal myself as they advanced on us. Their eyes are lit with bloodlust. There was a loud whump from high above us. The things paused, their expressions suddenly turning wary. My oxygen-deprived brain didn't understand what was happening at first. Not until the snow began to shift under my feet. I staggered over to Derek and tried to yank him up. He was lying face down and his blood had soaked into the snow beneath him. I had just enough time to say his name before a massive wave of snow flung us forward. I tumbled head over heels, no longer able to tell which way was up or down as the snowy ground and star-strewn sky became an incomprehensible blur. I barely managed to keep a hold of Derek as the snow carried us down the slope. Something sharp and hard abruptly arrested our fall, slamming into my right side with painful force. A boulder. Derek's body pinned me against it trapping me in place. I screamed, which made my side hurt even worse, and I had to bite my lip to stop the whimpers that wanted to escape from my throat. The whole ordeal only lasted about 40 seconds, but the snow had buried us and those other things deep within its grasp. Everything was pitch black. How far from the surface was we? Six inches? Or six feet? I didn't know, and it hurt to breathe. I had to act before it was too late, before the ice settled and prevented all further movement. I knocked the snow away from our noses and mouths and created an air pocket. I had to be grateful for the boulder now because it had properly prevented us from being buried even deeper. But how long would our air supply last? Time lost all meaning. Minutes. Maybe even hours crawled by. I tried to stay calm because panicking would have only wasted our limited air supply. But it was hard to think about things that I might never get the chance to do again. Visiting my parents, hanging out with my friends, 
going back to school to finish my master's degree. I didn't want to die here. I didn't want to die at all. But I was going to. And soon, if I didn't decide what to do within the next few seconds, I forced myself to reach out to Derek. His skin was cold under my fingertips, his pulse thready and weak, but he was still breathing somehow. I could try, and most likely fail to dig a way out for both of us. Or... I swallowed hard. My fingertips skated over his back, and for a heart-stopping moment, I thought that it had been dislodged and lost forever. Just as mine had, but it was there. Dented on one side, but there. His oxygen canister. Derek struggled weakly as I began to detach his mask from it. What are you doing? He slurred, his voice hoarse. He tried to bat me away, but neither of us could move much because of the immense pressure from the weight of the snow. And Derek had lost a lot of blood. I didn't respond. I didn't have the breath to. Moving as quickly as I could, I attached my own mask to the canister and took a deep breath of the teeny artificial air. It was so cold that it hurt my throat to breathe it in. And I never felt anything better in my life. And I did my best to ignore Derek as he tried futilely to take his oxygen canister back from me. As he stopped breathing, as a choking rattle issued from his throat. I couldn't have done anything for him. We would have both died. It was every man for himself up here.